Coming up on Extraordinary Faith, travel with us to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we'll be attending the Sacred Music Colloquium of the Church Music Association of America. Over 200 people from across the globe come to this conference every year to learn how to sing Gregorian chant and sacred polyphony. We'll hear the success story of a parish in San Diego that offers a popular summer camp that trains children how to sing chant. We'll learn about the only fully extraordinary form parish in America that is led by a diocesan priest. And we'll hear how a basilica in Chattanooga is revitalizing its sacred music program by embracing the church's classical repertoire. The hills of Pittsburgh are alive with the sound of music here on Extraordinary Faith. Hello, I'm Alex Began. Welcome to Extraordinary Faith, a program that travels to cities large and small, but always big in faith, in search of fascinating developments in the world of Catholic tradition. This is our first of two episodes coming to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've come to check out the 25th annual Sacred Music Colloquium, where the best and brightest church musicians from around the world have come to perfect their craft. We'll meet some of the teachers and students and we'll observe them in a rehearsal for an elaborate Latin Mass. First, let's get an overview of the event from one of the organizers. Over 200 church musicians have gathered here in Pittsburgh. Janet Gorbitz is the general manager of the Church Music Association of America. Janet, tell our viewers what this colloquium is all about. Well, the CMAA is made up of members all over the United States and we have many international members as well. The organization is 50 years old and this is the 25th year that our members have met together to get training, share camaraderie, and enjoy beautiful liturgies. So this is the 25th anniversary of the first one we had. It's a time for musicians to not only gain education, but also to learn specific things, say, on the type of semiology, chant direction, uh, singing polyphony in a large group. It's just a wonderful week for people to learn. What sort of strata of society attends these colloquiums? Are they young? Are they old? Uh, advanced? Amateurs? Where do they come from? We have the full spectrum, really. We have people who are professional musicians, people that direct choirs. We have many amateur musicians, such as myself, who sing in choirs or maybe have started their own small choirs to try to improve the use of the sacred music in their own parishes all around the country. We had a number of people from Canada this year, in fact. So it's an international group as well. So a beginner wouldn't feel out of place here? Not at all. We have beginning polyphony choirs available for training there. We also have a beginning chant choir for men and women where they can learn the basics and then each year build on that knowledge and perhaps grow into a different choir in the future year to keep learning each year. Why did you choose Pittsburgh? Pittsburgh is a wonderful place and Duquesne University has been such a wonderful host to us in the past years. We had our first uh, Pittsburgh Colloquium in 2010. We had 2010, 2011 here at Pittsburgh at Duquesne University and at that time we formed a relationship with Duquesne University where they offer course credit for students who want to gain course credit for attending our programs and learning. How often do you hold these gatherings? We do them every year. We try to pick a space that would be a nice location centrally available to many people. Thank you, Janet. We're going to get a little nosy and check out what people here are saying about this gathering. I think the opportunity to get together with other like-minded people and to sort of have a, a confidence about the future of Catholic Church music in this country in particular is really a positive thing. It's just so uplifting to come here yeah. and it's all this beautiful music, beautiful liturgy, 24 hours a day. It almost feels more like a family when you're together here for the colloquium than anything I've ever been a part of. OK, 
Okay, let's learn that phrase. Nu 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 through in Latinia. Nu 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 nu. Nowadays, it's not uncommon for there to be Gregorian chant workshops offered all around the world, but somebody had to be first. One of the pioneering chant instructors who went all over the place to give his workshops is Scott Turkington. We caught up with Scott this week in front of St. Paul Cathedral here in Pittsburgh. Scott, what is the main difference between Gregorian chant and what the majority of Catholics might experience at a typical Sunday Mass at a typical parish? I would say there's quite a, quite a large difference, really. Uh, while there's a lot of good music going on in our parishes all in the United States, Gregorian chant is quite different from what we usually hear in a typical parish on a Sunday morning. Uh, Gregorian chant is composed in church modes, has a certain atmosphere about it, and the compositions which are proper to the Roman Rite through the last, oh, at least 1,500 years. The corpus of Gregorian chant was especially composed for the Roman liturgies. Uh, and of course, as we know from reading our documents, still very much enforced, wanting to take first place. The documents tell us that Gregorian chant has first place, pride of place uh, in some translations in providing the music for our liturgies. Does Gregorian chant have a place in the ordinary form of the Mass or only the extraordinary? Very much in both. When the Mass was published in 1970, very shortly after a new chant book was promulgated by the Vatican, uh, containing all of the chants proper to what we call the new rite or the ordinary form, we call it now. So yes, we have all of the Gregorian chants proper to the Novus Ordo Mass in Latin or the new rite in English, the, extra, the ordinary form rather. And of course the extraordinary form, the Missal of 1962, has its own set of proper Gregorian chants. Most of them are the same in both forms. Let's talk about your approach to teaching chant. You've been an ambassador for this. You've traveled the globe yourself <laughs> teaching these workshops. Why? Well, of course, the music is proper to the Roman Rite, and it's incredibly beautiful. We lost something in that period uh, in the 1960s and 70s, and even the 1980s. We lost a connection to that music and its special character. Gregorian chants uh, gives us a sense of the sacred in a way that most other music can't. I love Gregorian chant, I, I always have. In my lifetime, always been enough interest by students and teachers in learning more about the chant. It's been my pleasure to share what I know. What do you hope your students here at the conference take home with them back to their home parishes? I would say two things, knowledge, what little knowledge we can give them in six days together, and inspiration. Inspiration to try to improve the music in their settings, whatever that may be, a college setting, a parish setting. Our crew was fortunate enough to be able to film some of the liturgies at the conference this week, and one thing I noticed is there were multiple choirs singing at the masses. Could you explain to our viewers why there were so many choirs and what they were doing? The conference is about 225 people. If we had more people than that, we'd have a problem in that not everyone would be able to sing. So we keep the conference at this size. We always fill up. Uh, and the conference is then divided into what we call polyphonic choirs. That is, you choose a choir that is going to sing a particular mass. Say, today we had the Misa Lauda Sion by Palestrina. The people who signed up for that Lauda Sion choir have spent the last several days learning that mass setting, the Kyrie, the Sanctus, the Agnus Dei, and today they were able to sing it at mass. While they were practicing those masses, the other five choirs were practicing the music that they will sing at mass. Thanks, Scott. Now let's listen in on some of these choirs.
Several years ago, I attended a Tridentine Mass in San Diego. It was held in the chapel of a mausoleum, of all places. Eventually, the Latin Mass community there got its own church. Marianne Carr Wilson is the music director of what is now St. Anne Parish. Marianne, take us forward from those crazy days at the cemetery chapel. In 2008, uh, one of the local parishes in the San Diego Diocese was scheduled for closure. And there was initiative on part of this Latin Mass community to approach the bishop and ask if, instead of closing a parish, they could invite the priestly fraternity in and uh, the rest is history. That's when Father Gizmondi came, he's our pastor. You have a church, you have a fraternity of St. Peter Priest. How many people are you getting on a weekend now? We're close to 900, if not higher. We've been steadily growing. We had 10% growth for the first several years. There's been a concerted effort on the part of the Legion of Mary group to go out into the community, to go out into the neighborhood and bring people back in who may have stopped practicing their faith or might be interested. Several converts come through our doors too. They're, or they come in and then decide to convert. We have three priests working all the time and we're really blessed, frankly, pretty spoiled in that regard. I, I have to ask you about a video that went viral a while ago of your choir breaking into song in a restaurant. Yes. What was the story? <laughs> They're all about the flash mob, and that particular morning we had been in, um, we had a really early mass, so we've made it a fun tradition to go out to breakfast afterward as a group and families and other people from the parish who want to come. And sure enough, every time somebody will say, hey, let's sing Ave Maria, let's sing O Manu Mysterium, you know, something seasonal. They're very liturgically correct about these things. Now, you're also known for work you do with children and mm -hmm. teaching them Gregorian chant. When I came to St. Anne's, Father Gizmondi wanted a chorister program. We were trying to model our program after Jeffrey Morse's great work up at St. Stephen's in Sacramento. I started this chorister program and I thought, I was very nervous because I thought everyone thinks I can work with children because I'm a mom and I'm a woman and I should be able to do this. I didn't know a lot that first year, but what I found really quickly was that the children were so eager to learn, and if you gave them this challenging, timeless music, they would rise to that challenge every time. I think more directors would want to start a chorister pro program if they knew how easy it was. Now, it's not just a chorister program. You actually have a summer music camp. At St. Anne's, we have chant camp. I had this idea from the Church Musician Association of America. They had what was called a chant intensive, where adults would come, fly into a city with a nice atmosphere, and study chant all week long in preparation for a song mass at the end of the week. I attended one of those and I can say it was very intense, but it was great because we all had this shared goal and we just immersed ourselves in the musical structure of the mass, which is really important for church musicians. And I said, what about taking this chant intensive idea from the CMAA and adapting it for kids and kind of just opening up the possibilities for more and more kids to learn chant. Because I saw how meaningful it was to them. They're, they're singing the prayers of Thomas Aquinas. They're singing, uh, you know, the Psalms day in, day out. They're singing, they're learning the Gloria. It's really sinking down deeply into them. So I thought I would, you know, just, like I said, cast the net wide and see how many kids wanted to come. Where can people find out more information about this camp? The best place to go would probably be our website, the parish website. And so the Church of St. Anne's in San Diego. Thanks, Mary Ann, and we wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Over the past 25 years, a number of exclusively extraordinary form parishes have been established across North America. Most of them have been led by one of the priestly communities dedicated to the Old Rite, but an increasing number are being led by diocesan clergy. 
Father Robert Paisley was the very first diocesan priest to lead such a parish, Mater Ecclesiae, in Berlin, New Jersey. Father Paisley, let's make sure everyone understands the terminology. What is a diocesan priest? A diocesan priest is a man who is ordained for a particular land area that is uh, ruled over or directed by a bishop. So I grew up in the count Gloucester County in southern New Jersey. I entered the seminary to study for the Diocese of Camden, which is the six counties of southern New Jersey. And once you're ordained, then you become a priest who works with the bishop in that diocese till you retire or die. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, you're attached to a diocese, and that's where you live out your life. Now, what's the history of Mater Ecclesiae, and, and how did you become such a pioneer? Well, it wasn't something I chose, uh, but as most things that are good in the priesthood, it was given from above, I think. Um, I was a, 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 an assistant for many years. Then I was a high school teacher and a vice principal in a high school. Uh, and the place Mater Ecclesiae existed from 1968 on. Uh, it had been founded by a man by the name of Brother Joe Natali, who formed a group of uh, a, a monastery of crippled brothers. And he tried to get the bishop to recognize it, and he wouldn't. And it was right around the time of the changes, so he formed Holy Family Monastery, which celebrated the Latin Mass against the wishes of the bishop. Uh, he died in 1995, but the people that worshipped there really wanted to uh, have the Latin Mass approved uh, by the bishop. So they approached him and they asked. And so at first he said yes. It was after, it was about 1997. This is many years after the first permission in 1988 by the Pope. And he said it could start out just as a Mass chapel. Uh, there was a, a, a guest priest there for two years. And then in 2000, uh, Bishop DiMarzio, who's now the Bishop of Brooklyn, called me and asked me if I would take it over, that he was thinking about turning it into a parish. And he wasn't even sure if he could. Uh, he actually went to Rome and talked to the Ecclesia Dei Commission to see if it was permissible to establish this as a diocesan entity. And he got the green light. He called me and said, I want you to go in there, and we're going to see what we can do. What's the parish like now? Do you have your own church? How many people attend? We have our own church. We have a big hall. We have a rectory, and we have classrooms. Uh, there are about 400 families that are now registered, and it's on a property of nine and a half acres. Now, one of the things that we hear about Mater Ecclesia year after year is your special mass in a cathedral. And I understand you're in the Philadelphia Cathedral now. Yes, uh, it's kind of rare to have a diocesan parish go to another diocese. Last year, uh, we were invited to come over to the Basilica of Saints Peter and Paul in Philadelphia. And we have this uh, very large mass to honor Our Lady and to thank God for the establishment of Mater Ecclesiae. Also with the, um, the idea that we would feature one of the great choral masses of our history that we can't do in our little parish. So explain for our viewers what a choral mass is and what it involves. Right, well there are various forms of mass. There's chant mass, which is all uh, on one note of music. Uh, then you would have polyphony, which would be a Renaissance reality where there are four parts based on chant. And then you have what's called concerted music, where the music is divided into four parts or even more than that. And some of the great masses would have been written by, say, Mozart or Haydn, uh, and uh, they also involve a full orchestra. So uh, for 15 years we've been doing this. Uh, last year the mass was the Lord Nelson Mass of Haydn with full orchestra, and the mass was attended by, I would say, about 1,200 people, including the Knights of Malta, the Knights of a Holy Sepulchre, and many of the priests of the area came for it. You're also actively involved in the Church Music Association. What brings you to these conferences year after year? When I was a young priest, I went to a meeting in Delaware, and there was a, a Monsignor there who was going to give a talk, Monsignor Schuler, who was at that time the president of the CMAA. And he said to me, we're going to start up a colloquium. You've got to come to it. So I came to the very first one, and I've been to almost 25 of them. I think I may have missed four because it was the only place at that time where you could learn anything about Gregorian chant, about polyphony, about how it works with the liturgy, and what the Vatican Council really said about these things. Uh, I have learned so much uh, that I can't even describe to you. Uh, it was the only place where I could. And in, in retrospect, I see that God was preparing me because when I got to the parish where I needed to know all this stuff, 
by coming to this for all those years, it prepared me so that I could just hit the, hit the ground running and start with a music program knowing what I had to do. And now that I'm, the, I'm the, uh, the chaplain for, I guess, five or six years, I just love passing what I've received on to others, especially the young priests who are eager to learn all this stuff. One of the criteria used to determine whether a church should be designated a basilica is the excellence of its music program. Maria Rist is the Sacred Music Coordinator at Chattanooga, Tennessee's Basilica of Saints Peter and Paul, where there are many ears to serve. Maria, set the scene for us. What is the liturgical life like at the Basilica? At the Basilica of Saints Peter and Paul, the Mass is at the center of all that we do. We celebrate in both the ancient and the modern forms of the Roman Rite, and we actually include elements of, from the ancient liturgical tradition in the modern form. Besides that, we participate in traditional Catholic devotions like Eucharistic processions, the May crowning, Stations of the Cross, Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. What is the music like at these Masses? At the Basilica, we aim to fulfill the Church's vision that was handed down with the Second Vatican Council. And that means that we actually sing the words of the Mass that come from the Roman Missal and the Church's official songbook, which is the Graduale Romanum. The priests and deacons have their part that they chant. The assembly chants the responses and sings the ordinary of the Mass in an ancient setting, whether it's in English or, or Latin. And then the choir and cantors have their parts. They sing the propers of the Mass at the appointed time that are specific to that day. You do your Holy Masses in the extraordinary as well as the ordinary form. Do you have two different choirs for that? We have several choirs at the Basilica. We actually, even though we're a small parish, we have about 700 families, but we have about 40 to 50 music ministers, including our Spanish and English and Latin Masses. We have one choir that is more of a beginner level and sings the propers all in English and they just rehearse an hour before Mass. But we have a more advanced scola that rehearses intensely every week and we prepare the Gregorian propers using usually Latin, sometimes English, and a full repertory of sacred polyphony to sing at these Masses. And that choir serves both the principal Mass of the ordinary form and also a once a month extraordinary form high mass, a misa cantata. We also have a children's scola that sings twice a month, once in the ordinary form and once in the extraordinary form. Oh, that's interesting. How do you get children interested in the old Latin mass? They actually are very interested and it, it's surprising the way this happened. Their families came to me because they were wanting a program for their children to learn a little bit of Latin, to understand the prayers of the church, and to learn to sing. And the initial group was just kids that are about five years old, but we started attracting, just within a few months, kids that were all the way up to the teenage years. And they were just fascinated by the sound of this chant and just even singing in unison. This actually all happened before our basilica developed an adult scola, but it attracted their parents to come and join the music ministry, and it attracted other families from outside of the parish. Let's talk about the music you offer outside of Mass. Do you have concerts at the Basilica? We do. One of the functions of a Basilica is to be a community center, center of culture. And for that reason, we have started offering some concerts. We recently had an organ recital. We've had vocal recitals. We've had outside choral groups come in. And more and more, we have groups that are asking to come and sing in our beautiful architectural space. And they want to sing sacred music. So we're going to keep that going. I would also add that it's important for all of us music ministers to be patient with the progress. You may not be able to jump in right away and do the full Gregorian propers of the Mass with the group that you have, with their level of skill and with the level of understanding of the congregation. And it requires pastor support as well. So we need to pray for patience and obedience. And remember, finally, that the Mass is not a concert. It is an offering that we give to God, and He can make it perfect. On our next episode, we hit the hilly streets of Pittsburgh and stop in at St. Boniface Church, 
the home of the St. John the 23rd Parish, a Latin mass group whose growth is in large part attributable to innovative and persistent use of advertising. We'll meet the priest who served the Pittsburgh Latin Mass as it transitioned from startup phase to one of the largest Latin Mass communities in North America. And we pay a visit to the St. Anthony Chapel, an unassuming little church which happens to house one of the largest collections of relics in the world. If you'd like to learn more about the places we visit, go to the episode pages of our website, extraordinaryfaith.tv, and click on the links. We also invite you to like us on Facebook, where we welcome all your questions and comments. Thanks for making us your ticket to Pittsburgh, and join us on our next episode as we continue to bring you the glories of Catholic tradition here on Extraordinary Faith.